System Dynamics. System Dynamics sounds a bit like a general term as when we're describing the dynamics of any particular system. However, the word System Dynamics is special in that it refers to a modeling methodology developed by Jay Forrester in the 1960s. The main difference between System Dynamics and most other modeling types is that System Dynamics incorporates more than a specification of a model type. Instead, it is an engineering approach to creating a particular type of model. So System Dynamics tells one where to begin in the modeling creation process and then incrementally how to proceed to create the final model in subsequent steps. It's theoretically possible for all model types to be turned into engineering methods but this has not happened except in particular books each of which may help the student in their incremental model development. So system dynamics is a little bit unusual in that respect in that it is an engineering technique telling you how to proceed in the life cycle for model development. Now, system dynamics is mostly used in the biological and social sciences but it can be used anywhere wherever a flow, met a flow metaphor seems appropriate. All modeling and techniques involve metaphor and system dynamics certainly is no exception. We have a flow metaphor with pipes, valves, and tanks in system dynamics. Although the metaphor is not necessarily raised to this level in the typical system dynamics simulation software, and yet the metaphor is very appealing since it allows us to rephrase relatively abstract dynamics of systems in terms that we understand, namely the flow of water around a network that contains pipes and tanks. Here's an example of a system dynamics model for the population dynamics of the apple snail in the Florida Everglades. The snail is the sole dietary food for the endangered species known as snail kite, which is a type of bird. And so this is why it's important to study the dynamics of the apple snail. And we'll, keep, we'll be getting to some of these symbols in a later example. But what happens here is that you have a flow from left to right. And then these will be no, these, these green symbols right here are called levels, and they represent population values for eggs, juveniles, uh, pre-adult and post-adult, for instance, for the snail population. And then you have some constants which are designated by these small circular signs down here. So the main two signs that we have are the levels where if you want to continue with the water or fluid metaphor the levels represent the water that increases or decreases. This is a, a capacitor in a sense, a holder, a container for water and then these things are valves and they actually look a bit like valves and they refer to the rate that you have going between successive population stages for the snail. Okay, there are several steps in creating a system dynamics model. And we're going to go through an example step by step. But first of all, we'll just identify some variables of interest. That's it, our first step in the systems dynamics approach. The second step is to create a causal graph. Third step, place signs on the arcs and loops. Step four, assign types to variables, whether they're constant rates or levels, for example. Step five, create a flow graph. And step six, determine equations. To begin our discussion of system dynamics, go ahead, let's go ahead and take a look at the relationship between variables. Now we might have some variables. You might say that, hey, our food intake as humans, the amount of food that we eat, bears 
a kind of relationship to weight. And we would reason as follows. We'd say as we increase our food intake, our weight increases. As we decrease our food intake, our weight decreases. And so we have these two variables, food intake and weight, and then we have a relationship between them. So this is the very beginning of what's necessary in order to build and think in terms of system dynamics. Where there's fire, there's smoke. We've certainly heard that expression, and that can be just denoted like this, that the amount of fire increases the amount of smoke, or the amount of fire more particularly is related to the amount of smoke. It may be that, uh, that as you increase the fire, you decrease the smoke. Uh, that's not the case in this particular case with fire and smoke, but for two arbitrary variables, the arrow that is between them can be as you increase one, you increase the other, or it could be as you increase one, you decrease the other. It could be a negative relationship. Likewise, you might say if there's an increase in fire, then there's an increase in heat. So we can proceed like that. So this is very foundation of system dynamics in terms of identifying a few variables and their relationships. Let's go ahead and look at a simple causal diagram. And this is for a heating control for humans. We might say that we've got some variables. We've got some variables like body temperature, sweat glands, body odor. Already this is getting exciting. So exciting that I combined body and odor into one word. So let's go ahead and change that. Bodor. Something new for Webster's. Okay, so we'll put body odor right here. Let's go ahead and add a few other things. We can have sensor. That's our skin. And we have pores over here. And then we have external temperature over here. And now we've identified the variables. We have to go ahead and connect them. So we say external temperature has an effect on body temperature, which in turn has an effect on the skin, which in turn has an effect on the sweat glands, which in turn has an effect on pores, which in turn has an effect on body temperature. And so we notice a kind of a feedback loop here, and this will be important in system dynamics to identify these feedback loops. And then the more you sweat, the worse the odor, right? So we'll put a little link like that. So this is a basic heating control for a human and represents an initial stage in a potential system dynamics model of the human heating control system. Okay, so what we're going to do now is we're going to have a comprehensive example. We're going to go through all the steps in order and engineer our system dynamics model. And this system dynamics model is going to be for the dynamics of building growth and death. Now, since we're talking about buildings, we don't talk about growth and death. We talk about construction and demolition. So let's go ahead then and begin. Step one is to identify variables in, cons in, in the construction and demolition of buildings over a particular area. So what we're going to do is we're going to say we have some industrial buildings and we're going to put a variable right there. And we have a construction and demolition. Now I'm conveniently putting these in juxtaposition to one another so that they work out to be a nice graph when I'm compl completed, but really you could put these anywhere on the page. It doesn't matter where you, you put them. You can put the variables anywhere. Okay, there's going to be some land here, and so we're going to have a fraction of land occupied. And we'll 
have a construction fraction. We have a certain amount of land that's going to be available for industrial buildings. And so we'll just say land available down here. We also have an average area taken up by each building. So I'll just put average area. And we have an average lifetime for buildings. So I'll put average lifetime. Now, after we finish step one, where we've identified all our variables, step two is to go ahead and create the causal graph. So that's what we're going to do right now. In order to create the causal graph, we just need to connect these variables together in a way that it's clear that something flows between one and the other, or one is the cause for the other. So for instance, construction is influences the number of buildings. Okay, and demolition certainly influences the number of buildings. Okay. The number of buildings we're going to say influences the construction. Maybe if we have more buildings, we're going to have less construction. And also a number of buildings will affect demolition. A construction fraction is just is going to affect construction. And a fraction of land occupied is going to affect construction fraction. The number of industrial buildings will influence the fraction of land that is occupied. And these three things over here are going to be constants. They're just going to drive certain variables that we have here. Land available is going to affect or decide the fraction of land occupied. Likewise, the average area per building is going to affect the fraction of land occupied. And the average lifetime of building is going to affect the demolition. So we've gone to step two now. We've identified the causal graph. Okay. Now the next thing we have to do is we have to put signs. Step three is to create signs on arcs and loops. So we're going to go ahead, go ahead and first of all create signs on each of these arcs. We take every single one of these arrows we put a sign, a negative or a positive, depending on which is most appropriate. So we say that there's a positive sign here. As we increase construction, then we increase the number of buildings. And I uh, misspelled that. I need to have an industrial right there. Okay, as uh, we increase the amount of demolition, we're going to decrease the number of buildings, so there's a negative right here. So this is, gives us a good beginning to, to putting the signs on this because we see that here's an example of a positive relationship between two variables. Here's an example of a negative relationship between two variables that makes some sense. You increase the construction, you're going to decrease the number of, they're going to increase the number of buildings. Likewise, you increase the demolition and you're going to decrease the number of buildings. So we continue likewise. We'd say if we increase the number of buildings, let's say that we'll increase the construction. And as we increase the number of buildings, we're going to increase the demolition. Okay, These are going to end up being rates, but we haven't got quite gotten to that step yet. And what we'll do is we'll just go ahead and put signs on each of these things. Now you may say with some of these, and I think it would be logical to ask yourself, does it make sense when looking at this particular example that construction fraction increases construction, or that fraction of land occupied would decrease the construction fraction? Uh, and really this has to do with the domain of study. And in this example, we're, we're not domain experts, we're just going over how system dynamics works 
and in what order we have to do what's, which steps and what each of those steps is comprised of. So we're not really that concerned with does it make sense. Now hopefully it makes enough sense that we can suspend our disbelief if we have any uh, to where we understand what's going on in this engineering process. And by and large this, uh, even though this came out of um, a textbook, this makes a good deal of sense. We can look at the positive and negative relationships here and it makes some sense. Okay, now what we're going to do now is we, we've signed the individual arcs. We need to sign the loops. And first of all, you need, or cycles. And first of all, you need to de detect a cycle. Here's an example of a cycle right here. Okay, here's another example of a cycle. Okay, here's a, yet another example of a cycle here. Notice this one here. It goes all the way down here, all the way over here, all the way up here and around again. So we look for these loops and all we do to create the signs for these loops is we multiply every sign in the arrow that is used to create the loop in the first place. Multiply those together and that's the value of the loop itself. So plus times plus is going to give you a plus feedback loop. Okay, Whereas this will be a negative feedback loop because we're taking plus uh, you can think of it as plus one times minus one. Uh, then we have a negative feedback loop here. Likewise, this is going to be a negative loop because we've got minus one times plus one times plus one times plus one, which is minus one. So we're going to have a negative loop here. Okay, so now what we've done is we've finished step three and we have signed all of our loops and we've assigned all of our arcs. Okay, now what we're going to do is step four. And step four is we're just going to define the, or assign types rather, to variables. Then we'll define symbols that are needed for step five, the flow graph. So first we're going to assign types to variables. We're going to look at these variables and going to go, what types are they? Are they rates? Are they levels? Are they constants? Okay, well, what we're going to do then is just say that construction is a rate. So we'll put a little R there. This is a level. This is a rate. Then this is an auxiliary variable. I'll be describing these in a little bit more detail in a second. This is another auxiliary variable. This is a constant this is a constant and this is a constant okay so this is the way that you we are to understand rates and levels rates and levels really are the key variable types that are in a system dynamics graph levels are the states they are the containers so those they are the the memory if you like for the system and levels are going to be interspersed with rates so what you're going to find in the typical system dynamics graph is you're going to find a kind of hopping sequence from rate to level to rate to level to rate to level. We saw this with the system dynamics graph for the apple snail. So you're going to have a rate followed by a level, followed by a rate, and then if we were to continue this, followed by a level, and so forth. So levels are the states, and then rates are what they sound like. That's where you're going to have derivatives, first order and second order derivatives. But in the system dynamics graph, we're really looking at first order derivatives with respect to time. So this would be construction rate, demolition rate, and then the number of industrial buildings which represents the state of the system. Now these auxiliary variables, there are two of them, construction fraction and fraction of land occupied are used in order to better define the rates and the levels. All they are are variables that equal expressions. Constants are the very beginning of the line. They're, uh, they're just what, what they sound like and what they would be in a typical programming language. They're not going to change, whereas the auxiliary variables are going to change. Our next step 
which we might as well do up here is we're going to use certain we're going to create a flow graph and the flow graph uses specific icons for system dynamics and these icons are two dimensional so you have an icon per type of variable so for instance a level we're going to use a rectangle icon a rate we're going to use an icon that looks like this and we saw this in the apple snail example an auxiliary variable we're going to use a circle and then for the constant we're just going to use a circle with a bar through it we're going to have two kinds of arcs we're going to have flow arcs which will designate as a straight line like this and we're going to have cause and effect arcs The cause and effect arc is going to be dashed, a dashed arrow like that. And sometimes there's one other icon that's used. It's called a source, and this is where the, you have an input to the system, if there is an input. And the input to the system is often represented as a cloud-like shape thing or as an amorphous blob like this for whatever reason. So we'll say that this is a source and likewise you could if you wanted to have a sink and the sink could also be represented by this amorphous blob okay our next step then is to use these individual symbols to rephrase this as a flow graph so all we're going to do is replace individual things that we have in here with these symbols Okay, so in order to do that, we're going to go ahead and erase everything that we have here. And we're going to go ahead and draw the flow graph for this system. The flow graph is going to look very simple. What we're going to have is we're going to have the construction rate, the number of buildings, demolition rate will be here. and then we're going to have some loops so these are flows this is going to be flows through the system and they're going to have some cause and effect loops we're going to have fraction of land occupied FOL and I made a mistake here I don't want to I want to make that uh, dash dark so I'm going to go ahead and do that and likewise, what we're going to say is the number of buildings that we have has an effect upon the construction rate. And the number of buildings that we have has an effect on the demolition rate. Okay. And we're going to have a construction fraction, another auxiliary down here. And we're going to have... I'll put a cause and effect arc there, one here. These arcs mirror exactly the effect the, the arcs that we had in the causal graph. And then we're going to put three constants. We've got land available for industrial buildings. That goes like that. Another constant right here, average area per building. So this is average area. This is land available. And then over here we have average lifetime of buildings, which is another constant. And that's going to affect this demolition rate. So we'll say average lifetime. And then this, this again was construction. This is a number of buildings, and this is demolition. So here we have our, call, our flow graph, and we'll label it as such. Now, the last stage is one that's usually done automatically, but can be done manually, and that's to take this flow graph and convert it into a set of equations. 
that when solved give us a simulation for the system. And there's a fairly simple rule with regard to system dynamics graphs and turning them into equations. What we'll do is we're going to start with every level and we're going to say that that's a state variable. So we're going to say, let's say buildings is B. And we're going to create a, gr a differential equation that says dB dt is equal to construction rate minus demolition rate. So all we're doing is we're saying here is B for the number of buildings. That equals the thing coming in, the rate coming in, minus the rate going out. So this makes actually quite a bit of sense. Now, this, these, the differential equations come about only in casting variables associated with levels. And then the rates, of course, can, have, can be affected by buildings. So what we would do here is we might say, all right, C is some function. Let's take a look at C. C is some function of B. And so I'm just going to put F1 for some kind of function of B and the construction fraction, um, CF, right here. So we'll say B and CF. Now what particular kind of function it is depends on whatever we find to be the most valid way to represent this model. I mean, from our perspective of modeling, we can imagine this to be any function at all. You can add these two variables. You might multiply them. It depends whatever makes the model valid. Okay, D, likewise, is going to be a function of what? It's going to be a function of average lifetime, or AL, and B. So we'll put D is equal to some new function, F sub 2, of B and average lifetime of buildings, AL. Okay, and likewise, you're going to have values for CF. CF is going to be another function dependent on this, and this will be another function dependent on this constant and this constant. So after you've written out two more equations, one for CF and one for a fraction of land occupied, then you've got the necessary five equations to solve the system.